I hope you've had a, a useful and informative day. Um, what we're now going to do, we're going to wrap this up with um, a session where we talk about the political dimension of providing for cycling. Um, I think uh, this is something that, as perhaps things have actually begun to happen, um, uh, that pr provokes uh, a reaction. And I think we've now all come to realise that, 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 that how we tackle this political dimension, how we actually make the case uh, and encourage and, and, and get decision makers to to actually implement the kind of things that we want to see, it's, it's, a, it's vitally important. Um, but of course, it's, it's not something that uh, certainly people who come from through my route of the of the practical, the engineering side, the planning side, are trained to do. And, you know, so we've got a lot to learn uh, here. Um, fortunately, we've got a great panel who are qualified to talk about this, including two real life politicians who actually know what it's like to have to make these decisions. So um, we have uh, Professor Peter Cox of the University of Chester and has written and studied uh, this, this interface between politics uh, and infrastructure, uh, Councillor Anna Richardson from Glasgow City Council. We're looking forward to that. And Councillor Julian Bell, uh, uh, now board member of Transport for London and uh, of Ealing Council. And then um, uh, following following them, David Hughes of Constructing Excellence and Principal Engineer with, with Swansea. And uh, then finally, someone who will be well known to you for from the Ideas with Beer sessions, but also have been active in this uh, field for many, many years, Robert Davis, the chair of the Road Danger Reduction Forum. So really looking forward to this. Um, please, but we, we're going to keep the presentations fairly short, sort of five to ten minutes. Uh, and not all the speakers will have slides, so they're just going to speak about the subject. I'm sure questions will come to you uh, as, as, as they speak and then afterwards during the discussion. So just put, pop the questions in the, in the Q&A. Um, we'll we'll field, field them behind the scenes and, and I'll put them to the panel and hopefully have a, a really informative discussion. So that's enough from me. Um, I will now hand over to Peter and uh, we'll hear from our first speaker. So thanks very much. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna talk for a few minutes. Um, some of the things that uh, have come out from, from the work I did on the Politics of Cycling Infrastructure book that seem to be fairly pertinent to the discussions that are going on at the moment. and. In particular, I want to talk a little bit about the idea um, to step back from the immediate issues uh, uh, and to try and work out some of the stuff that's going on behind. Why is infrastructure always political? And it's political because it affirms some possibilities of action, in increase, it infirm, affirms some ways of doing things. And in doing that, it always renders other actions less desirable. If you're going to increase the possibility of actions in one area, then you decrease others. And these changes affect people differentially. So it becomes an issue of justice. And so that's why, of course, LTNs are political. No matter what we might say about, oh, well, look, they're good for everybody in general. To be provocative, they actually reveal the privileges and prioritizations currently already given to some and render undesirable the actions of those who've taken their privileges for granted. So my argument in the policy uh, of infrastructure, cycling infrastructure book, it's that it's not just about design and rationality or a technical question of getting the right, uh, the right uh, engineering standards, though these are really important and they have to be asked and they have to be masked, uh, uh, mastered by those tasked with delivery. But let's step back. The city, the urban administrative area, it's a provisioning machine. It supplies stuff for people. It supplies its citizens with goods, but it has a limited capacity to do that. It can't provide everybody with everything that they want. Distribution is unequal. And that means that citizenship is unequal and experienced unequally. And what we've faced with is that those who are currently privileged may, may not recognise it as such, are challenged by the urge that we as people who want to make changes want to step in and redistribute the power and privileges. Let's take uh, some work by Gartner. Um, who's looked at this in, 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 in depth. And she identifies three approaches to thinking about infrastructuring. Technocratic approaches, 
They focus on the material value, the provision of in infrastructure interventions. You know. What does it? What good does it do? How does it directly affect uh, certain people? Cost benefit analysis. We can prove it. It, it generates this uh, this uh, much return for this much investment. It's an appeal to reason, rationality. We're all familiar with that, I think. Um, but it's focused on the users. It's costs its benefits are from those who are users and in doing so it overlooks the non-users it creates certain exclusions it can be really powerful because it depoliticizes the issues it doesn't it, it's just a matter of rationality and economic rationality um but it renders the social conflicts that are behind the desire to for that we have to intervene in the first place, it renders those invisible. We've got another category, which is very similar, but into uh, which she calls interventionist approaches to infrastructure. And it, it, it extends that idea of cost benefit away from the direct to users and to all sorts of offsets. So we talk about uh, in, in providing cycling infrastructure or low traffic neighborhoods, we might be thinking about health benefits or carbon uh, uh, carbon reductions but again that's not focused not very good at dealing with the non-users it often shifts the blame onto them implicitly or otherwise but you know, oh look you're not using that therefore you are to, to blame for your own ill health or the ill health of the pop found in the population or the failure to reduce carbon emissions might be well and true that's not a problem but it's there is a shift of blame and it kind of puts this category of those who use the infrastructure and those take and are benefit by those as inherently good and highlighting the gains it makes for them of course makes them a target for the non-users and so bright clash isn't irrational it identifies a real threat to privileges and the third category is of critical approaches, which don't deny the utility and the value and deployment of those other two approaches, but it focuses primarily on the existing power relations. To do so requires transparency and diagnosis and process and meaningful engagement with those affected, clarity on what's being addressed. What's, what is this trying to do? Why? For whom? And how? So the way to counter bike clash against LTNs, for example, is not to treat it as a technical exercise that people just don't get or deliver it on the basis that it's somehow better and uh, essential because it makes everything better. But work, and this came out, it's come out in several workshops I've, I've, I've been in today, to show how current arrangements make like life difficult for many and make other citizens especially, for example, children who have no voice in the public sphere. It's made them invisible already. So it's to show how what we have is a problem. And it's a problem not just because it's technically a problem or for uh, because it's inefficient or and it's not just a problem because it we could do better for for the planet or for each other, but because it's really messing up a lot of people's lives and those th those threat to lives are are actually need addressing and that's about power that's about privilege and it's being honest that it's about power and it's about privilege so those are the those are a set of conclusions that have come out from some of the work that uh, i've been looking at and that's all i've got to say okay it's a bit of a provocation but there you are um okay Phil, are we back? We are back. Yeah, thank you very much. That's really, yeah, yeah, that, that's really, really interesting. And uh, yeah, I see some people already kind of responded to that thought that, that, that inherently what we're attacking is is a kind of hidden, almost hidden in plain sight privilege. Uh, and that was a really, really interesting uh, contribution there. So um, next uh, speaker is Councillor Anna Richardson, the City Convener. Convener, uh, Sustainability and Carbon Reduction for Glasgow City Council. And Glasgow, we know, has been doing some great things recently. So really looking forward to um, hearing your contribution, Anna. 
Thank you, Phil, for having me here today. I've been political lead for sustainability, including transport for four years in Glasgow. And as you say, in that time, we've been making big efforts towards becoming a more cyclable city. And for the last year, we've, of course, been focused on our swift response to the COVID crisis, repurposing road space for walking, cycling and wheeling. In Scotland, that's been through the Scottish Government funded Spaces for People programme. And we implemented further school streets, over 40 kilometres of cycle lanes, and we removed traffic from several locations that we identified as needing more public realm. Now we're turning our attention to a new active travel strategy, design of a comprehensive city network, livable neighbourhoods plan to cover all of our city over the course of that proposed programme, and a transport strategy to allow us to decarbonise by 2030 in line with Glasgow's climate commitments. So I'm just going to share a few of my own personal thoughts on why this work is so difficult and what needs to change to bring more of our political colleagues with us along the way. First of all, I think we need to accept that for many people, most people perhaps, change is just difficult. And especially when we're doing that right outside people's homes. One of the lessons that we learned from Spaces for People was that the lanes, the, the cycle lanes that we put in, in very residential streets were the most challenging. They were the ones where we had the most difficult feedback. Removing parking directly outside somebody's house continues to be a sticking point. And perhaps lockdowns have made these projects feel all the more sensitive. We couldn't escape our local environment for long periods of time. And so our feelings about home and our own communities and, and our own streets were heightened. But I think there's also some room for optimism coming out of this pandemic. The last 18 months have shown us that while we don't necessarily like change, we as humans have adapted to it far more quickly than perhaps we would have expected. And having confidence that new road layouts will bed in relatively quickly should help us to ride out the difficulty of getting them in in the first place. Secondly, I think we need to think about the role of consultation. What questions are we asking? And what level of expectation do we set up that we can deliver the good stuff that people want without ever taking anything away? What can't happen is a popularity vote for each project. We need to genuinely engage with people about what we're doing and how we're going to do it. But we also need to be clear about what is a strategic priority citywide and how much room for manoeuvre that will give us within local schemes. Of course, we have to be sensitive to local needs, but we can't sacrifice the bigger objectives that will bring huge benefits to many people. And I'm really interested in how we shape those conversations, how we highlight the positives that schemes can offer, such as the cleaner air, the quieter streets, the space for kids to play, that people always tell us that they want. Thirdly, culture. I think we need to talk about this. It's still seen as acceptable on social media or, or in public to be almost anti-cycling, to argue against cycle infrastructure, it won't benefit that many people, or to personalise the debate around cyclist behaviour. I think we've all seen those comments. But there needs to be a significant shift so that cycling is seen as a serious and necessary mode of transport at every level and everywhere. Elected representatives need to represent a mixture of constituents' views, but that doesn't mean that we should always just take those at face value. The evidence is there. It's been there time and again that investment in active travel is good for cities. So we need to tell that story to those who aren't already convinced. And we need to enable our colleagues to trust that the evidence base will mean that their areas will reap those rewards too. Let's take that evidence and speak about it in a way that feels relevant and tangible to them and to their communities and to their needs. And finally, in a, a related point, we need to be willing to speak up about the challenge of competing rights. The right to drive anywhere at any time should not come above the rights of children to breathe clean air or to ride their bike safely or to feel comfortable just going out and about on the street. And of course, the climate emergency should remind us that we all deserve to have a future in a sustainable world. And reducing transport emissions, we all know, is a crucial part of this. Too often we hear more from those who will be inconvenienced than from those who are perhaps more vulnerable and will benefit greatly from traffic restraining policies. We need to consider our role as politicians and how we represent the interests of those who won't always be heard otherwise. We come into politics to make the places that we live better. So we can harness that to enable positive change. And especially if we design projects that bring together walking, cycling and wheeling in a way that gives politicians confidence that these changes will be beneficial to the majority of their constituents. We need to harness the courage that we showed in lockdown as we reacted swiftly and we implemented measures at a pace that I have certainly never seen before. And we now need to move into a space where we continue to take this action in response to the climate emergency. But now we have an opportunity to bring back what was lost during this time, the engagement, 
the conversations and the on the ground work to bring people with us along the way. So let's get our local politicians involved and enthused about the potential that these investments in their communities have to really help those communities to thrive. Thank you. Fantastic. That's really, really interesting, uh, Anna. And uh, it, well, something we might, we might explore. I think that that the um, the relationship between a politician and uh, and his or her electorate is a, I'm sure, a, a very interesting and dynamic one. And and that might be an area that you know to to think about. Um, where where does the power lie? Is is is, it, is it with the politicians? Is it with the people? And and which people? So, yeah, great. Um, so uh, next, next up, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Councillor Julian Bell um, from Transport for London, who has uh, a lot of experience of the, the pain of <laughs> uh, implementing low traffic neighbourhoods uh, and other forms of infrastructure. So um, Julian, over to you. Julian, you're on mute. Yeah, that's another donation to the mayor's charity. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and uh, let me just say, uh, I'm going to speak from two perspectives. Um, I'm a TfL board member, so I've got a London perspective and my slides are pretty much uh, from a London TfL perspective. But um, I was leader of Ealing Council up until May of this year. Um, and so introduced uh, all of the uh, low traffic neighbourhoods in Ealing and, and cycle lanes and school streets. And for those of you who've watched what's happened in Ealing, you will have known that it's been kind of at the at the kind of battlefront. Uh, yeah, we had big demonstrations against the LTNs. I was kind of called the North Korean dictator. Um, there was even posters which said, uh, Bell end our hell. Um, uh, and a juxtaposition, uh, given a well-known phrase. Um, I've written a Guardian article about the results of the mayoral election in London in low-traffic neighbourhood areas, and, and I'd encourage you to have a look at that because that shows you actually that the kind of electoral Armageddon that uh, some people thought would happen uh, in, in low-traffic neighbourhood areas with opposition uh, didn't transpire. Anyway, uh, let me uh, just go on to my next slide, which for some reason is not moving. Right. There we go. So uh, the outset of the pandemic brought a complete change to our operations in, in London. Um, we got to radically think about how we move people around. Um, we developed the street space plan, uh, which was challenged in the courts and then was uh, subsequently uh, upheld by the courts. Um, we've delivered across London, 22 and a half thousand square meters of extra paving space, 100 kilometers of new upgraded cycle routes. Um, and, and then I'll come on to low traffic neighborhoods and, and, and school streets, but also massive uptake on the Santander cycle hire scheme, 330,000 new members and 10 million hires uh, were made in 2020. Um, so, as we go forward now, we've got to avoid a car-led recovery. Um, and obviously, with people being fearful uh, for COVID reasons to go on public transport, we've got to make public transport, cycling and walking safer so that you can attract people to those modes of transport and get them out of uh, their cars. And so actually the pandemic presented us with a strategic opportunity um, to catalyze more trips by public transport, walking and cycling, as people have re-evaluated their lives and their travel choices. So um, in addition to the risk of a car-led recovery, uh, we've got to recognize that the pandemic's exacerbated a range of acute and urgent challenges that must be tackled 
if London is to achieve the mayor's transport strategy aims. And the key one there is 80% of people travelling by public transport or walking or cycling by 2041. Um, we were in the lower 60% on that target figure before the pandemic, and it's actually gone down to about 58%. Um, I won't say any more on this slide, but you can have a look at it when you get them. Let me move on to the meat of the topic, low traffic neighbourhoods. Uh, they've formed a key part of street space uh, planning in London. And um, in fact, uh, LTNs and modal filters have, have been in London for a very long time, decades. Uh, De Beauvoir in Hackney, uh, filtering was introduced in the 70s. More recently, and you all know, Mini Holland in, in uh, Waltham Forest. Um, but there's over a 1,000 modal filters in London across all 33 boroughs, um, and you've probably seen them. Um, during uh, the period after the pandemic uh, in the last year, 89 LTNs across 18 boroughs. And interestingly, and this is really key for politicians to understand, because even when you present them with the facts, sometimes they don't accept it because people are shouting at them. Um, pe people support low traffic neighbours and, and the polling all suggests that. So on the slide there, the most recent poll, March of this year, 47% support LTNs, 16 opposing. Um, last autumn, uh, a TfL customer survey in October and September, 45% supporting, 19% against. And then again, September 2020, 42% uh, agree, 30% opposing. And, uh, opposing. and that was when uh, LTNs were just being uh, implemented across the city. So uh, I just wanted to talk through some of the commonly raised issues that politicians have to deal with. Um, and, and these are things that opponents and people who are unsure, residents will come to you and say it increases traffic and air pollution on the boundary roads. Now, what we found in London, and that we found this in Ealing as well, that there has been no significant increase uh, in traffic on LTM boundary roads. There's a concern about increases in emergency vehicle response times. Um, you know, again, uh, the way LTNs are designed is so that every house is accessible to uh, an emergency vehicle. Um, having talked extensively with the emergency services, uh, you know, we we changed our LTNs uh, to put in a a, a AMPR cameras in so that we, we had better access for our emergency vehicles and they've not registered any concerns. And also there's clear evidence that LTNs reduce uh, traffic accidents and therefore the need to call out emergency services uh, more in the future. Issues with disabled access uh, is, is a concern of people's. Again, um, actually, uh, there's a majority of, of uh, people with disabled access issues that support LTNs and everybody can get to their individual home within an LTN. Now, it may be that you have to uh, go a, a longer route round in order to get to uh, your, your home, uh, given the layout of the LTN. And that raises this, this concern about increasing journey times. Now, um, you know, sometimes that that will happen. Um, that's inevitable. Um, but equally, LTNs do take traffic off the road, and sometimes that will actually decrease journey times. Finally, there's concerns about increases in crime. Uh, again, the evidence shows that uh, uh, there are decreases in, in, in crime. We found that in Ealing, and also that's been the case in Waltham Forest. So what are the advantages of LTNs? Um, I've talked about less traffic. Um, they, they will uh, make more people do those short one kilometer or less journeys rather than a car, either walk or cycle them. 
and I've said already they 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 um, are safer with less accidents. And this is really important for politicians to understand some of the big issues that LTNs address. Um, we tackle they tackle air quality, they tackle climate change, and. Uh, the inactivity crisis and obesity crisis that's costing the NHS uh, a billion pounds a year. You know, active travel, cycling and walking will address those huge, big strategic problems and issues. We've talked about less accidents, and that's the Vision Zero goal uh, that the mayor has uh, to to get to to no deaths on the whole uh, transport network. Uh, in London. Now, I just wanted to quickly finish on some changes that have just come through in terms of the statutory uh, network management duty guidance from the government. It came through from the Secretary of State for Transport on the 30th of July, and it was clear that uh, local authorities should not remove LTNs or other active travel measures without evidence of their failure. And equally, it made clear that they should actually there should be a presumption to leave cycling and walking schemes in place uh, and do so long enough for their impacts to be properly assessed. Another uh, Im implication of that announcement was that there's going to be a thirty percent increase in in spending on active travel in twenty one twenty two, um, which is a really positive thing. Um, and then in terms of what that guidance means, and I think, you know, the question was asked, what, what more powers do local authorities need to move forward with active travel policies? And these really help. Um, so there is a presumption that, uh, that local authorities should continue to reallocate road space um, to active travel measures. Um, in terms of monitoring and evaluation, um, trial or experimental schemes uh, should be left in place for that full 12 month duration. Um, and also uh, there should be professional polling um, and that shouldn't be uh, the entirety of, of, of uh, your decision making. Uh, you need, it's not a referendum. You need to make sure uh, that you look at the data as well as any professional polling that you do, um, because that will give you a fuller picture in which to make any decisions on. Um, obviously, engagement and consultation, it was difficult during that first tranche because we were only given seven days of consultation, but we did experimental traffic orders in Ealing, and that allowed us to actually use the whole of the period of the implementation as a consultation in real time with a real scheme that people were experiencing so i would i would actually say that we've always been looking to consult and consulting but it, clearly that's critical um and then finally local authorities have been told by uh the um, secretary of state that um if you prematurely remove or weaken any of these schemes then you may well uh, have a reduction in your future uh, funding. Um, just finally, on, on school streets, I think they're pretty popular. I don't think we have too much of a problem uh, in, in, in getting support for those 59% uh, support the creation of school streets, um, more use of, of walking and scooting and cycling to school uh, where school streets are, are, are in place. And um, yeah, we've got over 330 school streets uh, as part of street space across London. Final, final word in terms of politicians, you need to have a backbone. You need to have courage. Uh, you need to be able to, to be resilient when you get death threats and when you have uh, people screaming and shouting at you. Um, and you need to stick to your guns, frankly, um, and recognise that... Uh, the bigger picture, uh, the climate emergency, the air quality uh, issues, the, the uh, other big strategic issues are what we're looking for here. And actually, there is support for 
low traffic neighborhoods. You're not going to get these things in without some opposition. So you have to have uh, a firm conviction uh, and a backbone to uh, see it through. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Dina. That's really interesting. Um, I, I just reiterate um, uh, in, in, the, in the chat, we, we, I th I'm not sure we've had any actual, lots of comments, which is great, but not actually any questions that I can put to the panel. I'm, just, I'm thinking of some as we go along, but if you've got any questions, please put them in the Q&A box and, and we'll, we'll, we'll pick those out and then we can make sure that um, you get, you get uh, answers to the questions that you, you want answered. Um, so moving outside London and England and to, to Wales. So really pleased now to hear from David Hughes, uh, Construction Excellence Wales and the Principal Engineer with the City and County of Swansea. Over to you, David. Thank you, Phil. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to come here and talk today about what Swansea has been up to the last couple of years. Um, my presentation is slightly different to the others. Um, I work within a capital projects team, fundamentally involved with the delivery of these projects. So don't necessarily get the death threats that others do, but um, still have the challenges. So yeah, principally, um, what I'm here to talk about today is about what we've titled Going Beyond the Red Line. There's a number of ambitions that local authorities are seeking to deliver, and ultimately they're all supported by and underpinned by what active travel seeks to deliver. So in Wales, we're very fortunate to have the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act, which allows us to assess and define the criteria for new infrastructure based on um, a number of key goals, such as uh, prosperity, health, community connectivity, all things which are underpinned by active travel. Um, an example of this is in Swansea, we've got a number of social and economic challenges. And uh, this chart here shows that you know, nearly 30% of population don't have access to car and van, um, higher percentage again between 20 and 29 that don't even have a driving license. So you can see one key opportunity through active travel and in terms of providing opportunity for politicians to to show uh, commitment and market some of those other offset opportunities is, is, to, is to drive that economic prosperity challenge. Uh, you know, the, the obvious heat map then underpins our, our active travel ambition and you wouldn't be surprised to hear that there are health challenges around those key areas shown in the darker zones on this chart. So we've got the Act, uh, we've got design guidance, and we're fortunate to have funding. But that doesn't necessarily mean we've got the communities supported from day one. And I think that's the challenge for us as officers, to give politicians that ability to deliver these schemes in a, in a manner that, that works. So um, this is the, the, the scale of ambition in Swansea. So the course is to the south. The key blue areas, blue routes, are the existing networks in red is proposed. So more than double, nearly quadruple the, the scale of infrastructure within five years, which we're on track to achieve. And as a local authority, we've got various opportunities to do that. So not only directly delivering, delivering Welsh government funded projects, but through planning gain, um, through our educational program, through uh, sort of one of six commitments, that's where we get the, the joined up approach and how I guess local authority has a, a unique position to do that underpinned by an integrated network map. And perhaps historically we've been, um, we've been failing in, in making sure it was connected uh, properly. So having a, a network map that shows the scale of ambition not only provides the community link to show, look, it's not just impacting you directly outside your property frontage, but actually it's it's providing a long strategic corridor. And, and maybe we're at fault for placing new infrastructure, new business developments and locations that make it difficult. So that's that's where our task is, not just in delivering the project. And not solely in active travel, you know, we talk about cycling consistently, cycling, walking and other sustainable modes. So um, contrary to the, the backdrop today, it's not always sunny in Swansea. Um, and it's about giving opportunities to commuters, giving them opportunities to link up with other sustainable modes. There are obvious barriers to active travel. And I think because as officers, we hear them consistently. We tend to blink at ourselves around them um, and avoid them, but we need to confront them. Yes, we've got funding, planning policy, ministerial approval, and obvious decarbonisation benefit. But if an individual feels they're at loss of losing a car parking space, that is the one and only thing they'll focus on. So rather than just dealing with that per se, I think we need to understand the community and wider context of what we're trying to deliver. So um, the wheel, the image on the left here, shows different coloured spokes. So each route is a different colour, and it's understanding your route is part of a broader network. And then each project... Um, references the, the route in a different colour bespoke to that. The ambition is that you ultimately feel linked part of the broader benefit. So these, these documents are presented to the community both prior and post construction. And they um, unashamedly don't reference the fact that your route will save you four minutes on construction, cycling from A to B. They reference all the things that historically people wouldn't be aware of. The fact that we, we may have delivered 20 new apprentices, 
had loads of free community benefits from local contractors, planted 4,000 trees. Those are the sort of things that historically the communities don't understand. And if we can present them to the community through the politicians, it gives us a better chance to do this image is an example of a, a scheme called Northern Strategic Route. So again, the coast to the south, two key arterial routes on the on the blue lines you see there, following all railway lines. But our, through planning context, really, we've developed industrial and commercial opportunity that's totally um, adrift from those networks. So our ambition is to link up that green swathe. And we've done that through a number of facets, whether it's very rural routes, some adjacent to the existing highway network or others using existing infrastructure, but all ultimately are placemaking. And that's something I think we historically forget. Yes, we're you know, slightly different to, to Ealing, as we've seen earlier, but ultimately it's about making better places for people. And COVID has shown that more than any. This image on the top left shows a wood carving of an owl, which is quite interesting because the, the contractor that was working on the site, small family-based contractor, on a weekend, he did free wood carving sessions and he asked if he could practice on some of the tree stumps. We didn't design into the scheme. He did it as a sort of a charitable donation. But ultimately, it made that community fully engage with that project and made us realise we shouldn't do this as an afterthought. Placemaking should be embedded from day one. And again, it allows people to feel embodied into the scheme. Each of these routes ultimately form green arterial networks in and around the city. We do have a green infrastructure policy. So all these routes now are looking at tree planting and suds development. So we're addressing flooding and green and ecology issues as part of these projects. Having three, four, five year funding programs is a game changer in terms of skills development. We are set the, the end of the M4. We do have limited skills opportunities and contractor opportunities. The nature of this work in terms of its um, technical ability suits small contracted development. So here you've got an example of a, a labourer apprentice that's come through the four-year programme, but we also got design apprentices coming through in, in our design office. And Charlie listed on the left, you know, he's gone back and designed an active travel scheme right outside his old school. You know, what one example that is is a STEM ambassador of those children. It's the stuff that we don't normally talk about. We're too focused on laying blacktop. Now, each of these contractors, I'd say about 95% of our projects are developed using framework contractors, which is hugely supporting our project because they they basically have a number of their staff live in these communities so they're fully supportive of a project that wants to um, enhance health uh, develop uh, sustainable modes of transport so they're, they're running competitions with each adjacent schools giving out free bikes cycle uh, racks like shelters scooter pods we even had parents come in of an evening giving um, free cycle repair sessions and these things continue long after we've delivered the infrastructure our road safety program that now is fully aligned with our active travel schemes so that our, our 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 teams go in and not only highlight the safety implications of the projects but highlight the benefits i think historically welsh government and others have been focused on the fact that they're trying to reduce commuter numbers but these are the commuters of the future we need to focus on these and the best thing i think we've ever seen is when a when a parent cycles to school the child drops the child off and then continues his journey or his or her journey to, to their place of work um, something I think that we need to acknowledge as well, that all our schemes are right. When they fail, we need to talk about it, promote our projects in a positive way, not just build infrastructure and leave it. So we run monthly online sessions, highlighting uh, ongoing progress, but discussing issues and having accurate data so people feel we're honest in our approach. Having 100% positive feedback is fine, but if you've got two people using it, it's not what it's about. It's about positive and honest um, feedback. Ongoing sort of user experience enhancement. So again, taking on that feedback, we've had a number of people saying they want to use active travel, but their their commute journey is too far or too remote, so they park and ride currently. So we've introduced uh, cycle storage, secure cycle storage, or a park and ride, so people can actually cycle that last four miles into the city, and it's giving them that opportunity we linked to earlier. So they have they've incentivized costs, uh, seasonal charges to park there. Their bikes with secure site, but they also have that opportunity on a rainy day, they can still use the bus. And the QR code reader allows them to then have access to secure parking in and around the city. So it's all linked up. It's not just about the basic infrastructure, it's the full user experience. So yeah, just in summary, it's, it's, it's about embedding the community from day one. Um, who are the end users? Why are we providing it? It's targeting the broad range of benefits that ultimately, as a local authority, you're trying to achieve anyway, whether it's greening, placemaking, skills, and, and highlighting the fact that it's all users. It's from young to old. And we talked about earlier, the young often don't have a voice. And if you give them an opportunity, I think you'll find that um, the statistics we showed earlier in terms of positivity ratings will go through the roof. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank, thank you very much, David. That's really interesting. And I, and I think it, it showed um, 
how you know having a strategy is 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 really important. So you know these and maybe that was the problem with some of the the, the emergency schemes that they they came forward. You know they uh, in in response to the emergency, but but clearly what Swansea is doing is is implementing a, a strategy and and doing that steadily with monitoring evaluation. That's fantastic. So uh, our final speaker, Robert Davis, uh, well known to many of you from the Road Danger Reduction Forum. Um, over to you, Robert. Thanks, uh, thanks, Phil. Um, sorry. Uh, oh dear. Um, wait a second. Um, sorry. Uh, I'm actually having a little bit of an issue. Uh, share, share screen, share screen. Uh, righty ho, I think we're nearly there. Right. Uh, okay. Yes, this is um, discourses of delay against uh, active travel measures, road space reallocation, etc. Um, this is uh, from some work in progress, which I'm doing with Professor Ian Walker and uh, Tim Gamble, who you come at it from a psychologist's uh, approach, whereas I'm uh, more sociological. And it's actually based partly on some work done by Giulio Mattioli on uh, discourses of delay around uh, climate change. Uh, it's very much about people who say, oh, yeah, it's very good, let's uh, do stuff for active travel, but not that scheme, not that project, not here, not there and ultimately not really anywhere. So uh, it's already been mentioned that uh, bike lash is uh, often uh, a kind of rational response, a response to the questioning of privilege. Um, and here's something said during uh, the Transport Committee of the GLA in 2017 by Andrew Gilligan, uh, who is very much the unsung hero of uh, today's uh, today's webinar, I think, because he's been behind so much of uh, what's been put forward over the last uh, year or so. Uh, and he said, my view is that backlash is inevitable whenever a meaningful scheme is proposed. Um, it's a sign that it's a good scheme because it does make a change to the status quo. Uh, and he refers specifically to filibusters. I'm talking here more about general negative reaction to uh, road space reallocation. Uh, could be LTNs, could be uh, separated cycle lanes, could also be enforced 20 mile an hour areas, etc. And uh, what we should be doing uh, is we do have to consult, we have to do so properly, explaining politely to everybody what the purpose of schemes are, what the uh, effects are, what we hope them to be, what we're going to be reviewing, what we're going to be considering, et cetera, et cetera. And it should be a polite and thorough uh, uh, consultation with everybody concerned. We should definitely do that. Um, we should provide the evidence that's been referred to in the chat. You'll see Roger Geffen's referred to some of the work. Um, uh, that's evidence about whether there's been traffic displacement, uh, what's happened with emissions, etc., uh, crashes, crime, and so on. And uh, councils like Lambeth and Islington, as well as Ealing, have uh, uh, done uh, some very high quality monitoring, which you should check out. Uh, there's also been in-depth work by the Active Travel Academy at Westminster University and, um, of course, research from the Department of Transport. So we should provide that evidence. Uh, we should allay genuine concerns from uh, some motorists with disabilities who uh, may feel there are going to be genuine problems for them. We should uh, consider them and allay genuine concerns. Um, we then have to start getting into the business of demythologizing. I've been trying to do this for about 35 years. All the stuff about I pay a road tax, I'm special because I've done a driving test, uh, I can get sent to prison if I do something wrong when I'm driving, etc. I pay for the road and all that kind of stuff. You have to politely and carefully uh, go through all uh, the morass of prejudice 
and bigotry, I would call it. So we have to do that uh, politely and rationally. But, 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 don't expect being rational and logical to work. And it won't work because of what you're up against. And what you're up against, uh, sorry, uh, as part of that um, rational and logical and polite discussion, uh, don't forget that after explaining basic facts, continuing uh, a supposed discussion with some of the people against you can often make things worse. There will always be a small vociferous group against what's required. And there are cognitive biases and the other things that psychologists can tell you about, which uh, mean that, in fact, the shouting match will just continue. Um, also, what you're up against is a background set of beliefs, a ideology, as we'd call it in sociology, uh, a set of beliefs about who the roads are for uh, and what owning a car um, gives you as a car owner or someone who otherwise uses cars. Um, and that's what you're up against. And so however rational you are, you will always come up against that belief system. And we need to develop concepts to refer to this refusal of uh, accepting any questioning of the car-dominated status quo. Um, it's the what's sometimes we call the so-called right to drive where, when, why, and how the driver wants. And that belief is in there at some level, not only amongst all too many motorists, if they're prepared to admit that that's what they actually believe, but it exists as a sort of belief system in a car-dependent society like ours. And it's not really spoken about as a negative uh, belief system or set of prejudices or bigotry like racism or sexism or ableism or whatever. Uh, and I think we do need to talk about it and question it and deconstruct it and engage with people and uh, tell them that uh, you think there are a lot of problems with this belief system. Uh, you can call it driver arrogance. Um, you can see uh, commentators in the press talking about cyclists being arrogant. And this may look like a mere inversion. Um, but actually, there is a lot of uh, commonly held beliefs uh, which do need to be inverted to be upended in order to see things the right way around. Um, the over entitlement of drivers uh it, it spreads out into wider questions about uh transport policy john adams has referred to hypermobility uh john whiteleg uh, calls it just mobility in his book i've referred to it as car supremacism in my book and it's it's this sort of set of unstated beliefs which are uh, cover everything from forecasting through appraisal through uh, to the current discussions about road space reallocation. And uh, I think we have to really get to uh, discuss it because um, it is about uh, privilege uh, amongst people who don't think they're privileged. And they may be very underprivileged in other areas of their life because of their class or race or gender or sexual preference or whatever. But in this area, there is a question of driver privilege, which we have to question. And we also have to be aware of the fact that a lot of people don't want to question it. But I think we have to question it. And uh, where we are now is at a stage where it's no longer a question of saying that walking and cycling are healthy and they're good for children and it's nicer to have less noxious emissions and we can reduce danger on the road and so on. Because on top of all that, we've also got 
climate change. And that really means that we do have to move away from increasing car use, from car dependence. We have to move uh, away from it. And that's not just getting some other people to get on buses or walk or cycle. It's about reducing car usage. And we have to be quite open about that. And when we get opposition, as we will, uh, do have a look at this forward to the publication which was one year on from gear change. And here you have the Prime Minister saying, if you are going to oppose these schemes, that's all the LTNs and other road space reallocation, you must tell us what your alternative is because trying to squeeze more cars and delivery vans on the same roads is not going to work. And that's the kind of thing we need to do. We need to be aware that it's a power struggle. Uh, uh, we need to be aware that a lot of people don't want to see any questioning of, the, of their privilege. And they may be otherwise perfectly nice people uh, who read The Guardian and all the rest of it. But you will have to oppose it. And I think we need amongst ourselves to conceptualize and operationalize what we mean by car supremacism and that block of unstated beliefs which uh, are behind the opposition to what we need to do. Thanks very much. Brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, a real call, call for action there. So, yeah, we've we've got um, about twenty minutes. Um, so we've had quite a few questions in. Um, we won't be able to get through all of them, I don't think. But I've just done a bit of a kind of sifting. So uh, I think the first one I'm going to ask is, is from from Mark Strong actually, um, and he addresses this to Julian in particular. So perhaps Julian can. Our first go, which was, um, you, you very much said, Julian, I think Annie, you kind of said the same thing as well, so maybe you could both comment on this, that, that what we really need is politicians who, elite, who lead. What do you do about chances and local parties who don't act with a view to the bigger picture and make and make decisions contrary to the network management duty or to, you know, to, to what we know is good for the planet and, and for people and all the rest of it? What, what do we do? How do we, how do we give politicians a backbone? So uh, this is a slightly tricky one for me because uh, my own council and my own Labour group uh, are now kind of uh, debating how we respond to this uh, this new statutory guidance. Um, and clearly I am arguing within my Labour group uh, for the retention of, of uh, the low traffic neighbourhoods. But, um, you know, uh, giving that bigger picture that I talked about in terms of climate emergency and, and, and uh, inactivity, uh, obesity crisis, air pollution, all of those things are things that people need to uh, see uh, when, when we look at this. But it's also about looking at the evidence, and that's what kind of frustrates me and why I wrote that article in The, in the Guardian. Um, because certainly the political message from that is that uh, yeah, we, we won't face the political Armageddon of losing votes by the bucket load if we do this. It's that, they're actually popular. Um, and there isn't a, 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 a too much of a, an electoral um, problem uh, with them. So it's, it's about giving people that message and and I guess taking it into the media as well is part of uh, the, the way forward. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, well, perhaps I'll, I'll put because we've, we've had a few more questions in, so perhaps I'll, I'll put them um, one at a time to, to individuals. So this one, I don't know if you could maybe comment on this one from Kit Allwinter. So government is saying we need, need to reallocate road space. Council officers say, even the polls say, yeah, MPs and councillors, some of them, but clearly, simply say it's not tenable. How do we overcome that? Which is a kind of similar question, really. I think it is quite similar. So I'll, I'll try and, um, and give something slightly different um, to that previous answer from Julian. I think one of the things that is quite helpful to acknowledge is that councillors are the ones on the front line um, who are out in the street 
um, talking to their communities about these things, who are the ones that will get, um, you know, a lot of the, the feedback, whether that's positive or negative. And I think it's okay to acknowledge that that's quite hard um, and that we need to support one another through that. Um, certainly one of the lessons that I had when uh, we were bringing through the Spaces for People lanes was that I was leading on the project, but I was asking my colleagues to take the hit in terms of we were bringing things out very quickly within their communities, within the areas in which they had to, to get support from the electorate. And it was really important that they were on board, that they understood exactly why we were doing this and that they were able to have the information they needed, you know, to 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 speak to their electorate and to explain why these things had to happen or, or why we were doing them in a certain way. And I certainly did, you know, often say thank you to them for, for carrying that because I think it is difficult um, and, and I think it's okay for that to be the case. I think in terms of um, what's already been said today about having the evidence there, it's all there. Let's make sure that we make that evidence feel relatable. Um, quite often when you're talking to a community um, in, in a part of Glasgow, they want to know about what what happens in Glasgow, that they don't necessarily want to know what happens in Amsterdam or in, in New York or somewhere else. So, you know, making things really relevant to them um, is important. And I think that becomes all the more possible, the more schemes we bring in. Um, we've got some beautiful um, high street examples, for example, in Glasgow now, where, you know, we can say to, to politicians from other local authorities, come and have a look and see when a scheme is finished, look at how thriving and vibrant this high street is. You can have this too with the right investment. And I think using that, that positive encouragement um, and, and seeing that it's an investment in their communities it's not a difficult thing for them to have to carry it is a positive thing and as Julian was saying it will um, be be popular once it's through um, and that's important to have that confidence I think once you start to see some schemes um, I think it's easier to to imagine that and to visualize that elsewhere as well you, you're muted Phil Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so that was really interesting. I was I was just saying that that's um, I think very interesting is building on that success and, de and and learning from it and demonstrating it um, and showing that actually these things do work. I just want to, Peter, do you have any comments on that? I, I saw that Brian Deegan has given your book a, a, a plug that, uh, that it's very it's fascinating. So whether you can give us any perspective on barriers in the minds of, of, of those planning infrastructure, um, but perhaps any comments about the generality of how to overcome that negativity yeah um part of it is it is good is funding um that those budget cuts mean that professional development training goes out the wall <laughs> um so so that there's what we end up with often is and, and this is an internet from international studies we the lack of career development training means that you end up with people um, planning infrastructure, making decisions about what infrastructure should be planned and what's what's required. So that so the whole anal analytical process from from start to finish is in the minds of people who might have been trained 20 years ago, who were trained in textbooks that were written 10 20 years ago and who and those who are in study are, are now are writing on the basis of what they did when they were students so you've got this kind of huge time lag which means that the only way to counter that is actually being bang up to date you, the comments that were coming around from from Roger this morning about the you know we've got this great guidance in LTN uh uh, in in the in the in the late the, the latest planning planning guidance, but who's going to read it? Who's actually going to have the time to sit down, and think how does this affect my job? What I'm going to think about? Where how I'm going to present this to the those who are going to unlock the budgets? You know, that takes that takes training, that takes time, that takes resources that are with that local authorities. Certainly, in my area, it just haven't got there. Utterly starved of, so the, the the barriers that are set up are partly partly the time lag, but partly kind of structural institutional ones that we don't have that uh, we don't have that forum. You know, yes, we've got brilliant things like this, and we've got all of those who are involved in today's sessions sharing stuff. Um, but I'm kind of also seeing, you know, the stuff that I'm hearing today is 
what is you know, when I started doing this 15 bit more years ago, uh, I came in late, was already in circulation then. <laughs> and so it's kind of like, yeah, we're slowly figuring out that something needs to be done. And it's that it's that time lag that that, that creates a huge set of set of barriers. But it's not unique to this country. What we do need is to address that and take that very seriously and think about you know, don't just say, oh, look, our local authority is ours. That still has, a, you know, we have a vulnerable road users person and forum. Great. That's dealt with cycling. Tick. Now bugger off and shut up. Um, it's I'm doing the most dis slight disservice there, but I don't think much, actually, having looked at the local uh, the last local plan. Um, they'll have me for that. I don't care. Um, so it's it's actually ensuring that that gets that gets sorted out that gets done and that we take people's careers seriously we take seriously yeah. that they need constant training they need time and resources to get in, into that and we need tra training for those for, for planners we need training for those in order that they recognize that there are barriers that the world is changing faster than uh, and, and certainly, certainly with the imperatives of, uh, of, uh, of cl the climate emergency, it's changing faster than we can keep up with within the institutional structures that we have. Thank you. Yeah, that's really. And I, and I think, you know, speaking to someone who works in consultancy and sees career developments, I think I think the point you make about about funding, that, that people will make their career choices to get, you know, spend their own time. And, and get up to speed well they will do that if they can see there is continued investment and it's, it's a worthwhile career path to go down so yeah. that, that's really interesting if and it gives you a competitive advantage, advantage it, it, indeed if, yeah if, if, people if want doing to do. that and keeping up to that gives you a competitive advantage great but that's not the structure that we have in yes yeah in the local in the local authority dimension of it to in, in a lot of cases so, so a question, question it, it, it comes from, it says anonymous, so we don't know who asked the question, but it, it, uh, one press put to Robert, and it's a kind of variation um, on, on what we've been talking about, really, about, about um, how do we you know, get decision makers to, to, to make the right decision. It says, in many cases, we have strong evidence, but local authorities, councillors won't listen and base decision making on those that shout loudest. What's the best approach to persuade them in the face of their irrationality? And, I, and I'm not sure that means irrationality of the public or irrationality of the decision makers of listening to the right people but perhaps you could you know how do we how do we persuade um uh, 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 councillors to address the kind of big the big questions you're the, the, that sort of car culture that you were talking about robert it does come down to what councillors and councillors at the top are prepared to do um because what peter was just talking about with regards to professional development the councillors are in a position where they can say to the head of highways or, or, or whoever, look, have you got officers who are genuinely committed, who really want to do this, who know their stuff, who've been to the conferences, who've been to Walls and Forest, who ride bikes every day, who have actually been involved in campaigning themselves and so on. And uh, if they haven't, then you need to get them on board. But to get the councillors on board, you really just have to take them through all the government stuff and say, this has to happen. And it has to happen because of climate change, because of congestion, because of this, this and this. And it's got to happen because of the negative stuff. So what I've been saying a lot is, um, you know, we're all very good at actually saying, oh, isn't this nice and nice pictures of cyclists riding along on the front of your bidding document. And uh, let's talk about positive stuff. I think we need to talk about negative stuff. I think we need to talk about what we're up against. And we need to go to councillors and say, look, you can get good stuff. Read the Active Travel Academy's research. Look at uh, Islington Council, Camden Council have done things on how there were increases in cycling. Uh, look at the kids playing out in LTNs, look at all this good stuff. Do you want to do this? And are you prepared to enter shitstorms? 
And if they say, yeah, I really want to do this and I'm prepared to come up against it. You know, I mean, I had a, a counsellor friend many years ago in Hackney and his big problem was opposing dog owners from shitting in the, in the parks. And <laughs> he said, I'm going to take him on. And he took him on. I mean, his, his wife lost all her hair. He, he was harassed in the street, all the rest of it. So, but he was prepared to do it. So you have to go to the councillors and say, there's a lot of good stuff you can do and you ought to do it. Here's all the evidence of all the good stuff, but don't forget you're entering a shit storm. And how you enter that shit storm is you uh, allay genuine concerns, you point to the benefits, you explain what you're doing, you do genuine consultation, but after a while, you realize you're not going to get, get anywhere. And uh, I'll, I'll give just one example of, of how serious this is. Years ago, there were people saying that black people had lower IQs than white people. That was a quite legitimate thing in public discourse. And we went through lots and lots and lots of rational argument about the problems with uh, culture embedded IQ measurements, uh, the difficulty of the concept of race, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The bottom line is, you can explain all this. You can say that racism has no intellectual basis, but what you're dealing with is people who want to feel good about themselves by being superior to another ethnic group. Now, and that's it, yeah? And if that's what they want, you just have to say, sorry, mate, you're wrong. I'm against you. And that, I think, is the kind of thing that we're going to have to do here. And we're going to have to recognize that block of prejudice as being just what it is, as supporting an utterly inequitable and wrong uh, relationship of power and privilege. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, a question I put to David. So maybe a bit more, um, and apologies, um, moving away from the, the strict politics, but just in terms of a lot of the focus on LTNs has, has been on London. You know, that's where, um, and but it's not exclusively that's where they are. There've been lots in other places, but perhaps it shows the way the media works is they've been celebrated. What's the data from other places, and, and perhaps with respect to, to Wales and, and to Swansea, is there, is there, is there much data that, that is coming out of Wales now? Because the Active Travel Act has been around for quite a while. So are we seeing the, the monitoring evaluation that we can really demonstrate that it works in what is quite a hilly part of the country? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, we did approach the subject with, with COVID as others did, uh, and funding was made available. Um, Swansea is an usual city, not only is it hilly, but it's quite narrow. It's quite a you know, traditional narrow city so there are limitations on our ability however um there's a former sort of industrial hub it does have really good arterial links in terms of former railway so the primary network is very positive it's that sort of last quarter mile it's really quite poor um the decision we made that was to fundamentally focus over the COVID period is to utilize some of that funding to uh, support people to find other sustainable modes for that last quarter mile or the last couple of miles through, as I showed earlier, the park and ride alternative. So that's something we've shown and um, positivity in that is that people who would have been nervous to go on public transport have found other sustainable ways for that last section of their journey. That doesn't mean that we've totally ignored those other challenging opportunities. Um, the reality is, is that we have uh, integrated network map development that has well advanced projects. So our decision was effectively not to do a temporary stopgap solution for six to eight months, but actually we could get through that period. Okay, we'd be another six months later, but we'd have a formal scheme. And it is a difficult decision, and that wasn't necessarily politically driven. I think we felt that um, putting something as a permanent solution that ultimately, not just cost, but it delivered in terms of uh, suds attenuation, in terms of issues we've got there, our green infrastructure policy, rather than just putting in uh, cylinders to delineate, uh, actually offered a better project. Now, each area will have a different answer to that but it suited us and, and we certainly are progressing in that direction. Um, it's not an easy answer, is it? And Julian's shown the difficulties in implementation, but um, it's certainly something we're not we're not afraid of. And I think we have to acknowledge as well that having strong politicians, what the, the, the political makeup of your area is, the political term, all those things come into factor. Um, 
we're very very strong where we are in terms of that issue um and it's not as easy for others but um i think in wales we've got a very strong message we've been at it for some time and yeah we, we would certainly in swansea want to be sort of leading the way with that brilliant thank thank you um i, I think we're, we're sort of coming to a close now we've only got two or three minutes to go but i i just there was one um a technical question for, for julian that, that that had been asked which was about um the the um, AMPR cameras w w were they just for emergency vehicles or, or broader than this? And and I think Tracy Vickers asked the question says um, they found that it, it necessitates such an inclusive whitelist for access as to as to be pointless. Um, so are you know what's the pros and cons of AMPR? Do do they solve some of the problems that you've seen in Ealing? Yeah. So. Um... If we gave uh, blue badge, we, we did give blue uh, blue badge exemptions as as well as uh, allowing emergency vehicles to go through, um, but we severely restricted the numbers. Um, so if if we we could have said all blue badge holders in the borough can go through every low traffic neighbourhood in the borough, uh, we have twelve thousand blue badge holders and we just thought that that would actually undermine undermine uh the the integrity of the ltn so much that you you know it it, it it would cease to do what it needed to do so so the exemption that we gave was that blue badge holders within their ltn had an exemption for their ltn only uh, they were not allowed to go through other LTNs in the borough. We 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 have nine. Um, so in that way, that kept the numbers low and and you know retained that um, kind of uh, move to keep uh, traffic down and 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 to give all those advantages that LTNs do for people walking and cycling. If you allow too many through, you just lose all that. Yeah, just, thank you. I mean, there is. There, sorry, just, just quickly yeah, on sorry. on the other stuff about um, how how do we get the politicians locked in in this? Um, you, one thing that we did, and we'll 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 have big discussions about it again. Is is we specifically included uh, in our 2018 manifesto that we were going to put low traffic neighbourhoods in. And so when it was thrown at us that you're doing this without a kind of political mandate, uh, we could point to page uh, whatever it was in our manifesto and say, look, it's there. It's clear. We have a commitment. We stood on a, a political platform to do this and you voted us in. And therefore, you know, representative democracy is such uh that actually you don't need a referendum you've that referendum was was the election um i think you do have to recognize that politicians are a twitchy and a nervous species when it gets to election times and so if you can uh actually marry your implementation with the electoral cycle so that you put them in after an election uh, then that would help. Now, you couldn't do that with COVID because, uh, you know, we'd, we'd not had any funding for, 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 for years and suddenly you get funding, uh, but it's linked to COVID and doing it very rapidly. So that that's what's given us a lot of the challenges that we face. But in a normal political cycle, uh, you know, if you put it up front and clear in your manifesto, and then say you're going to get on with it and implement it straight away after that election. I think that's the best way forward. Thank you. That's brilliant. Um, well, we, yeah, we, 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 I'm sure we could carry on, but I think um, uh, we were due to finish at, at uh, quarter past, so it is better to try to keep the time if we can. So um, thank you all very much indeed for the contribution. It's been absolutely fascinating and just you know taking us beyond... The, the the usual technical that we that, we, that those of us uh, professionals kind of busy ourselves with and trying to think about how this actually plays out in the political dimension which is really where the the the, the thing is you know ultimately will succeed or fail has been absolutely brilliant so thank you all very much for your contributions and thank to everyone for the um the questions been really interesting sorry that we didn't able to get through all of them but i think we got through most and and uh, certainly gave the issues a uh, pretty good airing. So, um, and um, yeah, we'll see you another time, I'm sure. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks.